one of the delightful things about uh, having a YouTube channel is that it's interactive. But of course, that's also one of the scary things. Uh, once one starts showing one's own little coffee-stained corner of the universe to folks, well, one is open to the universe, or if not to the whole universe, at least to one's viewers. And um, sometimes those viewers include, I think Adam and Eve subscribed to my channel. As I said, it's, or if I didn't say, it's, it's an interactive sort of thing. Not only can you comment, but sometimes uh, folks will send me messages. And I think if one is going to be pompous and <sighs> enough to make YouTube channels and post stuff, then one one should be willing to uh, to listen and respond to what people people say. And I have one uh, viewer, a delightful young man. Uh, he's 25 I think and I say he's delightful because he is he is honest he often well from time to time uh, sends me questions when he is when he is uh, doubting and so last night he he said I just I just don't know uh, I don't know what belief in Christianity means I said my best guide to the faith is is the Gospel of John. And I said, if I may, I'll, I'll sleep before I, I give you a, a, a big answer. And in a sense, this kind of gave me a, a free script, or at least part of the script, for a video. It also made me realize that I probably owed it to all of you guys to kind of be a little bit clear Let's see if about what it is that does sort of lie behind my stumbling little videos. So this is the uh, the answer that I made to my young friend. I spent many years trying to understand how things work. Astronomy, physics, mathematics, biology, all the usual stuff, as well as Bible study and theology. Having been raised a Baptist, I was pretty well ignorant of the traditional teachings of the church. So it was easy for me to fall into agnosticism. My philosophical studies, and I should add my scientific studies, prevented me from claiming to be an atheist. However, I am grateful for the familiarity with the Bible that I gained as a Baptist kid, because often the imagery and ideas of science, especially modern physics, seem to echo and resonate with images and ideas of scripture and especially as I alluded to last night with the Gospel according to John. The difference between John's presentation of the cosmos and Sagan and Company's presentation, of course, is that behind everything for John, there is a person, a person whom he knew, a person he had touched, a person with whom he had eaten, and whose mother he would spend much of his, and with whose mother he would spend much of his life. In John's Christ is not some dispassionate prime mover and changing source of change, but someone who deeply loves his cosmos and particularly the people he may to live in it. Despite Star Trek and E.T. or even C.S. Lewis's space trilogy, we haven't found any other creatures like ourselves. There may be some. The Christian view of history as presented in scripture doesn't rule out that possibility. But it does assert that our Creator is deeply concerned with us, even though we are often, in the wonderful words of Thomas uh, Coverdale, naughty or worse. It seems to me that more often than not, we are ruled by pride and by fear. And Jesus came into the world to save us from both. The one who, the one by whom all things were made, that were made, became an infant, and not just any infant, any infant, 
but a poor kid born among animals. So much for pride. And of course, what we fear most is death. The Lord of life, the one who gave us life, accepted not just death, but the worst sort of death the empire of the world had developed. Trampling down death by death. This is not a story that I can verify scientifically because the scientific method requires that a procedure can be reproduced. St. Paul says this was done once for all times, although the once for all act comes into our time during every Eucharist. One of the most interesting things I find about Orthodox Catholic understanding of the Eucharist is how it had foreshadowed modern quantum physics understanding of time and space. So, such an understanding puts the silly strutting of the world and its rulers in the shade, rather literally. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it, not in any meaning of comprehend. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, and here we under, need, I think, to understand his name the way it would have been heard by first century Jewish folk. He gave the right to become children of God who were born not by blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. This is a bold and remarkable claim, and it is easy even for those who have been born again jumping ahead in John's Gospel through Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus, who comes to Jesus under the cover of darkness, even for us it is difficult to grasp, to comprehend the breadth and the height and the depth of what has been achieved by the Incarnation. We often wander through life like Sir Gowan or any of the other folks in myth and fairy tales, which are often a sort of prophecy unawares without recognizing our patronage. Now, you know, what Jesus, I, I often claim that what I find so remarkable about the gospel according to John is that it is on one level just beyond belief. And it is, I think, that being beyond belief part that makes it so compelling. This is not the sort of stuff you can make up. And the, uh, the willingness of the early church to, to die for this belief, uh, I think, puts to shame the folks who say, oh, it was just all made up. I am reminded again and again of the, the sixth chapter of John, and I won't read it all for you now, because you can read it. But I suggest that you do read it, because it contains some of the most um, most remarkable events. You know, the the uh, feeding of the five thousand and the walking on water, and Jesus claiming to be the bread of life. And people don't believe this, and. Um, when many of the disciples heard it, they said, "This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it?" But Jesus, knowing in himself what his, that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Now, I would suggest that this is at least uh, as important a, 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 what do we call it, the testimony, I forget the, the feast we just celebrated, of Peter, uh, as 
is the one in in uh, Matthew. But uh, what I will add from Matthew's gospel is that no man can serve two masters. And the world today, as it has always been, is full of other people who are quite willing to have us uh, become their servants. Other people who are quite willing to become our masters. What they offer us are all those things that were uh, offered to Christ at the at the um, temptation in the wilderness, of course. But what they don't offer is eternal life. In fact, eternal life is a sneered at concept by many modern folk. <laughs> I never understand why people believe in reincarnation, but not, uh, not in eternal life. Well, I will just add that I'm thinking, and I think I owe this particularly because I sometimes, I sometimes uh, trouble with the last part of the creed, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And I think that is that even though we are children of the king of the universe, by adoption, by the blood and the water. We often doubt that we are like Sir Gallon, wandering around looking for the grail, even when the grail is right in front of us. And that is because we continue to, to be prideful and fearful. And so we reinvent Christianity every few years. Thinking no one has quite got it right yet because when the grill is right there in front of it we don't see it and we are fearful and so we we hedge our bets and we say oh yeah you know we believe but we also invest our most of our lives in the things of the world and i come back again to what matthew records no man can serve two masters well that was uh an unexpected video. For, I hadn't expected to make this video at this time. But, I, you know, we're told to be ready to, to uh, give an account of the faith that is in us. And so I thought, well, it wouldn't hurt if I did that. And um, it also was an opportunity for me to say how much I appreciate the feedback that you guys give because it does uh, help me to kind of hone in and consider seriously what I really do believe and um, how I should react to all the <laughs> bizarre things that go on all, of, all around us. And another opportunity to be grateful for the little things And this magnificent universe uh, that the Creator has given to us, put us in, such as coffee. Thanks for watching.